across the county we hear them calling from every corner of this fair land the women who built this world of ours the women who built this world with science technology medicine engineering maths with courage and force the Artistic Director and Theatre Manager here at Chelmsford City Theatres. Welcome to the digital version of Chelmsford Civic Theatre. This, number six of our online Zoom performances as part of Essex 2020 in partnership with the amazing Electric Voice Theatre and Essex Music Education Hub. For tonight's performance, Sounding Six, Bell Platt of Rittle and Aeroplane Engineer from Chelmsford. Welcome back again to everyone from last week and for anyone new joining us tonight. I'm particularly looking forward to tonight's event as not only did Platt of Rittle live and work in Chelmsford and Rittle, not far from this very theatre, she was also born around the corner from where I live, literally two minutes walk away. For tonight's performance, please look at the chat notes on how to pin the live BSL sign language interpreter video to your screen for people wishing to follow the signing of this event and also look at the chat notes for any other technical issues. There will be a question and answer session after the performance tonight so if you have any questions for any of our artists and experts please send them to everyone in the chat box and as in the live theatre please put mobile phones on silent and please turn your PC microphone and camera off. Otherwise, you will be filmed and heard. Mm -hmm. For tonight's performance, Sounding Six, Platt of Rittle and Aeroplane Engineer, our artists and experts are artistic director, composer, mm -hmm. soprano mm -hmm. from Electric Voice Theatre, mm -hmm. Francis Lynch. Mm -hmm. Production manager, sound designer, Herbie Clark. And just to remind everyone, please turn your microphones and your cameras off. Thank you ever so much. Um, our British Sign Language interpreter, Lauren Lister. Taking care of us from Chelmsford Theatre's marketing team are Victoria and Alex. Our soprano from Barefoot Opera is Jenny Miller. Digital artist Jack Connell, whose work features in tonight's performance. Our resident expert, science historian, Emeritus Fellow of Clare College, Cambridge, Dr. Patricia Farah. And this week, two incredible special guests, accountant, maths enthusiast, and sailor, Vicky Platt, who just happens to be the daughter of Baroness Beryl Platt. And I'm very pleased to introduce civil engineer, senior lecturer in water systems engineering from Anglo Ruskin University, Dr. Eric Maryam Imani. And now I hand you over to Francis Lynch from the amazing Electric Voice Theatre. Thanks very much, Ian, and thanks for inviting us to do this series of soundings from Essex. It's led us down many interesting and unexpected paths, discovering not only the history of six significant women scientists from Essex, but the work of their counterparts today. We have had fascinating conversations with historians, archivists, musicians, scientists, you name it, we've spoken to them, children, adults, and all of their insults have really informed our work. We began in the 17th century with natural philosopher Margaret Cavendish and the music of her contemporary Elizabeth Turner. And today we arrive at the 20th century and our final historical character, Platt of Rittle, and the music of her contemporary Essex composer um, Elizabeth McConkie. Both of these women have talented daughters and we are lucky enough to have Platt's daughter Vicky here with us tonight, who will not only join our discussions later, but will voice her mother's words during Patricia's talk. And Nicola Lefanu, 
who is McConkie's daughter, will have some of her music performed tonight too. Both families have close associations with Rissell and Chelmsford, so it's extremely fitting that they are closing our exposition of Essex Women of Science and Music from the past as part of our season with Chelmsford Civic Theatre in the year of Essex 20 STEAM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, Medicine and Maths. I'm just waiting for Lauren to catch up. <laughs> Initiative. <laughs> so, um, however, it's not the end of soundings. There are two more events which are about the future as well as the past. Next week we're joined by some very young scientists and musicians of the future who are going to share with you their work over the summer to produce music and art about the science of water and how it gets to your tap. And water is a subject that you'll hear a lot about this evening from our expert guest Mariam Imani. At our final event on December the 14th we have the debut of the Essex virtual choir who will be celebrating a great number of women of STEAM in Essex who've been nominated by you the public. Now if you haven't nominated someone for the Forgetting to Remember project please do before the 14th of September so we can include them in that tribute. And one of those who, who will be in it is composer Eliza Flower who was born in Harlow in Essex in 1803 and we'll hear some of her music tonight. She was a famous composer in her day, but her radical feminist views meant that there was a decline in popularity for her music from some scandalised people. So tonight's performance will be the first time any of it's been heard for 200 years. We're joined now by Patricia Farah and our Electric Voice Theatre singers and Vicky Platt and artist Jack Cornell to explore the life of Beryl Platt, Baroness of Rittle, and aeroplane engineer. Our first piece of music is by Nicola Lefanu from Rory's Rounds. It was written for children to sing, but tonight the electric voice theatre singers will be the echoing voices of Platt's dilemma. So Beryl Platt dedicated her life to Essex and to engineering. Her career divides conveniently into two parts. Her favourite subject at school was maths and she trained to be an aircraft engineer and these are two of the planes that she worked on, a hurricane and a typhoon from World War II. She was extremely successful but in 1949 when she was in her mid-twenties she faced a stark choice. Should she continue as a professional scientist or should she return to Essex and get married? I give my love a cherry with no stone. I give my love a chicken with no bone. I told my love a story with no end. Give my love a baby with no Essex and her family. This is her engagement photo. But that didn't mean staying at home. 
she became an eminent politician. This photo shows Beryl Platt and her fellow directors of British Gas in 1993. She often found herself the only woman in a man's world and she worked tirelessly to change that. She loved being an engineer and she wanted other women to enjoy a scientific career as well. She founded WISE, the national campaign to increase the number of women in science and engineering. And you can see in the photo, she's awarding a prize to a younger scientist. Her entire life was overshadowed by both world wars. She was born five years after the first one ended, but its effects lingered on. As a child, she lived near Southend-on-Sea, and this painting shows you how it looked at the end of the 19th century. And on the horizon, on the right, the long pier extends right out to sea. And during the First World War, Beryl Platt's mother was stationed there as a Morse code signaller. Her father was abroad for most of the war, held captive in a prisoner of war camp, where his only consolation was playing his violin. Beryl Myatt and her younger brother James shared that difficult family background with many other children who were born in the 1920s. And during the, their teenage years, they felt the possibility of another major war looming over them. She started by going to Westcliff High School for Girls in Southend. And while she was there, she met the young man she'd later be married to for 54 years. However, at the time, he condemned her as a swat. Men were still scared of women who were clever, especially when they were good at science and maths. Even her own father called her a bookworm. She was forced to leave Essex because her parents were so scarred by their wartime experiences that they moved away from the coast to be safer inland. And that was a very sensible precaution. In June 1940, many South End children were evacuated to the countryside. She was safely at school in Slough, where the headmistress recommended that she apply to Cambridge. In 1941, she was offered a place at Girton College, which was then one of only two Cambridge colleges open to women, and she planned to study maths. She was the first member of her family to study at university, and it was so expensive, her father was reluctant to let her go. When she was in her 60s, Beryl Platt published a memoir called A Life of Surprises. And one of the earliest surprises occurred when she was offered a special wartime bursary. The offer was too tempting to resist. The government would give her a £25 a week pocket money if she switched to engineering. And she remembered later that it seemed... A fortune to me at the time. She took it, even though she was not naturally practical. Her father said she was cack-handed. As a woman reading engineering, she wasn't made to feel welcome at Cambridge. For one thing, Girton had been deliberately built about two miles away from the city centre, so every day she had to commute in to the laboratories and lecture theatres. And then there was the gender problem. This photo shows Cambridge in 1949, only a few years after Beryl Platt was there. And you can see that the students are predominantly male. Women weren't even allowed to get full degrees until 1948, even if they came top in the exams, as some of them did. In Beryl Platt's year, only five out of 250 engineering students were women. And when she arrived in Cambridge, only nine women had ever studied engineering before. And many of the male students and lecturers thought that was nine too many. And they made their opinion clear. As a woman, it's extremely difficult to retain confidence in your own capabilities when everybody around you is convinced that you're incompetent. 
Making her life even tougher, the course was condensed from three into two years because the country was desperate for qualified engineers. But after she graduated in 1943, one distinguished man did take her seriously, and that was C.P. Snow, the chemist, who's now most famous as a novelist. He was then a careers advisor at Cambridge, and he recommended her to work at Hawker Aircraft. And she remained grateful for that advice for the rest of her life. She loved this top secret research, developing planes such as the Tempest, one of Britain's most successful fighter jets, during the Second World War. By then, there were quite a few female pilots. The most famous was Amy Johnson. She flies. She flies. She flies. In 1929, Amy Johnson received her pilot's A licence and aviator's certificate. Men do not believe us capable, capable. Where, where are the women engineers? Where are the women engineers? She became the first British woman to obtain a ground engineer's C licence. Men do not believe us capable. Amy Johnson made her record-breaking solo flight to Australia in 1930. Men do not believe us capable, capable. And during the war, 166 women enrolled in the Airport Transport Auxiliary, the ATA, to ferry aeroplanes, pilots and equipment between bases. She eight was an Essex woman, Joan Hughes, who was born in West Ham, which then was in Essex. She was also the youngest. She was only 17 when she gained her pilot's license. She flies. She flies. Where, where are the women engineers? Where are the women engineers? Aeronautical engineering was still a man's world, and Beryl Platt forced herself to overcome her natural shyness. In this photo, you can just spot her amongst the men in the second row, third from the right. And when she first walked into the flight test department, she said to herself, You could see by the look in the men's eyes. My God, there's a war on and we've got a woman engineer too. I couldn't ever let anyone down. We were testing and producing fighters, which really made a difference to winning the war. No, for a country that England long may be, the holy and the happy and the gloriously free. Now pray we for a country.
the music of Eliza Fleur, an early and very early Victorian um, composer, seemed the right choice for um, this film of Jack's, for its cry of peace in a time of war. But because the composer was, like Beryl Platt, someone who forged her career in a world which was not initially welcoming, in Flower's case, a woman with no money or musical education of any kind became one of the country's leading composers, published by Novello and supported by a group of friends, including the poet Robert Browning. Eliza Flower fought against the standard behaviour expected of women, but in a different way from Platt. On her father's death, she had become the ward of a Unitarian minister, with whom she continued to live after he had left his wife. Together, they spoke against the draconian divorce laws and advocated suffrage for women. Eliza Flowers mirrors the men that Platt met when she were, first worked at Hawker Aircraft that you can see here. Flower was the experienced craft person, not like Platt, the educated theorist. She was one of only three women in the department at Hawker Aircraft. And while she had a posh Cambridge degree and knew all the mathematical theories, most of the men had left school at 14 but were excellent technicians with masses of experience. She often worked 70 hour weeks, but she was paid only four pounds a week, far less than the 25 pounds she'd enjoyed at Cambridge. Before long, her work was so impressive that her salary was doubled. And later she gave younger women some excellent advice. She warned them that they should never learn how to type because if they did, they would get downgraded to being a secretary and serving the tea. On the other hand, she insisted that they should remain feminine, even when wearing dirty overalls, a view that now seems horribly reactionary. She followed her own advice and was still designing Hawker aeroplanes like this hurricane at the end of the war. She'd been so successful that her boss offered her a permanent job, but she decided she'd had enough of military work. And instead, she thought it more important to focus on aeroplane safety. For the next three years, she worked at British European Airways, designing protocols to reduce the risk of crashes and increase survival rates when accidents did happen. Then in 1949, she changed track and married the man she'd known in Essex as a child and had recently met again. Her husband, Stuart Platt, had been a captain managing the D-Day landings, and this is his photo. And although Beryl had not yet fallen in love with Stuart, remember he had called her a swat at school, she, like everyone at that time, would have been holding their breath, hoping for success. As Stuart watched his men plunge into the water, heading for the beach, it's likely that overhead flew one of the planes his soon-to-be wife had built. So many women would have been waiting at this time and hoping their men would return. This sense of waiting in dread, particularly of women, of course, it wasn't just women, but in this case of women left behind, is perfectly crafted in this next song by Elizabeth McConkie, which is a setting of a Rudyard Kipling poem, Harp Song of the Dane Women, about wives waiting for their fishermen husbands to inevitably leave them for the old grey widow maker. In World War II, this was not just the sea, but the machinery of war. What is a woman that you forsake her? And the horse fire and the homemaker to go with the old. One chair bed for all to rest in. Let's go here, sons, that the street birds nest in. She had. 
Stuart Platt was not taken by the old grey widow maker, but survived and later married Beryl Myatt. So like her own parents, the, Myatt, the Platts were a post-war. They settled in the picturesque Essex village of Rittle. Back then, getting married usually signalled the end of a woman's career. Her husband earned enough money to support them and their two children, but she refused to be a conventional housewife. Instead, she moved into local politics. Oh, I see her. Oh, Carol Platt was a dynamic Sorry. woman who converted being a councillor into a full-time voluntary job. Before long, she was elected to the county council based in Chelmsford, and for 12 years she chaired the Education Committee, which after London was the biggest in the country. Essex schools were expanding rapidly because many families moved there after the war. Platt was an exceptionally energetic reformer who was determined that all Essex children should have first-class education opportunities. She was extraordinarily effective and efficient, and accolades started to pour in. In 1981, she became a Baroness, Platt of Rittle, and for five years, she chaired the Equal Opportunities Committee. There was a standard joke that she carried a screwdriver in her handbag, but she explained, It's the symbol of my trade. And it's also jolly useful when the lights fail. She was regarded extremely highly and introduced many measures to improve women's education and ensure gender equality in every aspect of life. It be her, mo her most enduring legacy is WISE, the campaign to involve women in science and engineering that has had an enormous effect. She founded the organisation and she was the major driver of its success. And it became a wise slogan that You can't say no to Beryl! Her father once complained that Beryl was bloody pig-headed, but that can be quite a useful quality. For instance, she raised millions of pounds for a fleet of specially equipped buses that drove around the country. 
These mobile technological laboratories visited 4,500 schools and gave pupils hands-on experience that would have been impossible otherwise. And as you can see on the right, in 2003, WISE patron Princess Anne awarded Platt the WISE Lifetime Achievement Award. Beryl Platt died in 2015, but her initiatives have permanently changed opportunities for women in Essex. This year, the number of women employed in STEM subjects topped a million. The trend is still upwards, although there are still more men than women in engineering. Beryl Platt was a pioneering engineer, but her lasting value is as a role model to inspire future generations. Anne Minto, the businesswoman who herself smashed so many barriers, paid tribute to Beryl Platt, telling her she was an absolute inspiration to so many women who have looked to your technical achievements and your outstanding leadership qualities, and that has given them hope and courage to say that if Beryl Platt can do it, so can I. Thanks to Beryl Platt's energy and initiative, young women no longer confront the obstacles that she successfully overcame. Shout! 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 Up with your song, cry with the wind, for the dawn is breaking. March! March, swing you along, wide blows a banner and hope is waking. Ethel Smythe's anthem for women's suffrage, written in 1910, featured in the last week's soundings about Florence Attridge, an early radio engineer at Marconi's in Chelmsford. It leads us to another engineer who is working in Chelmsford today, very close to the New Street Marconi site at Anglia Ruskin University, where Dr. Mariam Imani is a senior lecturer in civil engineering. Hi, um, my name is Dr. Mariam Imani, and I'm a senior lecturer in civil engineering, as Francis said, at Anglia Ruskin University in Chancellor campus. I'm also um, a chartered civil engineer and a member of the Institution of Civil Engineers um, Essex Committee. I'm also school liaison officer of this committee, IC Essex Committee, and involved and engaged with STEM activities in the region. Well, my journey began with my, the first scientific book I received um, from my mom about uh, Milky Way galaxy at age six. And that was enough to mesmerize me. Um, and millions of stars, knowing about mil millions of stars um, inhabiting in this galaxy was quite inspiring. And my never ending questions from my mom. And that's it. I wanted to become a pilot. The only way that I could figure out at the time that can help me get closer to, to the galaxy. A year later at age seven, I got a giant Lego box and I can say that was the game changer at the time. It brought me down actually from the sky um, to the earth. I started enjoying um, and loving making things like buildings, uh, roads, bridges, anything that you can uh, make with the, Le with the Lego. And then my passion for geometry and maths um, led me to study maths and physics in, in high school. And eventually I chose civil engineering, which nicely brought my passion for maths and geometry, and at the very same time, building and making things together. So I did my undergrad in civil engineering. Um, following that, I worked a couple of years in industry and in practice. And then I started to um, decided to carry on expanding my horizon in the discipline. I wanted to know more about civil engineering. So I studied um, um, water system engineering as a specialist uh, branch of civil engineering. And water system engineering is all about uh, water and wastewater infrastructure, such as water supply system, 
sewer system, drainage system, reservoirs, dams, and even about natural resources such as a um, river, for example. After that, um, new doors were opened and I got to know many world leading civil engineers around the world in this field. And that was a turning point. It transformed my life from a practice focused engineer to a, towards a more scientist type engineer. So my journey continued when I got my um, scholarship for a PhD at Exeter University. And I did my PhD in, in this university, in the Center for Water Systems uh, in this university. Uh, Center for Water Systems in Exeter University is one of the world leading centers in this field. Um, and um, I had the privilege of working with many professors who are the leaders in the field in, in globally. And that uh, created lots of opportunities for me to get to know uh, world league scientists and also uh, practitioners. And I learned a lot in, in during that period, almost seven years at um, Exeter University and in this, in, in this center. And I can say that it prepared me to become a scientist in the field. After that, um, um, uh, working in um, Exeter University and Water Center, I got the job at ARU as a senior lecturer in 2015. And my journey, my teaching and research career um, uh, began at that time. Um, since then, I've been teaching uh, different modules in civil engineering, such as hydraulics, fluid mechanics, flood risk management, hydrology, water infrastructure, and so on. A combination of thought and um, lab-based works. Um, also, I have been, as an academic, I've been involved in several research projects as a principal investigator, as a corresponding investigator with national and international uh, collaborators, again, with national and international funding bodies. Uh, my cutting edge, edge research in water and um, base water infrastructure as a scientist aims to make life better for everyone around the world and in relation to water systems management. If I want to give you an example, um, in a project um, in collaboration with Scottish Water, Transport Scotland and SSE, uh, we modeled three key infrastructure of water, energy and transport. Uh, trying to understand how they are um, connected to each other and how uh, failure in one system can be cascaded to another um, system, how we can evaluate the system's resilience and recovery, and how we can find solutions to tackle the issues. This project had a very um, importance nationally because that's, that's a cutting edge uh, topic and challenge. It would be nice to share with you some of the pictures I've taken from different aspects of my, my profession, actually, in the field. Um, this is a picture I've taken in, um, taken in my hydraulics lab. Um, this is one of the machines that I work to teach about uh, how um, water flow in rivers happens, how building bridge, bridges, for example, affect the rivers and also um, um, flood plan areas in the rivers. So this is part of my hydraulics module. And again, how we collect the data and have used the later, uh, data later for further analysis with the students. For example, this is again another machines and we try to, uh, I try to explain the principles um, behind all these theoretical aspects that they study. Um, also, this picture was taken in um, construction area, is one of the typical um, civil engineering um, um, modules that uh, you imagine um, a civil engineer right in the um, in a construction site actually it was a, a women in engineering day this picture was taken in big bang event part of stem activities and ic's involvement with um, um, stem activities in the in the region in 2019 this picture was taken in, in Brazil in a workshop we ran um, as part of the project that completed in February 2020. We gamified a case study and flooding in that case study area. 
um, obviously, and you can see we are training some um, other scientists, PhDs, to understand how this works. And finally, this is the last picture we took as a like a celebration when that project came to end again um, in February 2020, just before the lockdown, and and the project that I led and came and um, came to end. It just pictures. The idea was just to uh, give you a flavor of of how how uh, research projects and teaching in the lab and also uh, again in, in a part of collaboration in, in, on a daily basis that I'm involved with that hopefully you have enjoyed it. Yeah well absolutely I mean I, I know Marion because we've spoken before that uh, you, there is so much more that we could learn from you <laughs> um, but can I take you back to the very beginning to start mm -hmm. with just because when you talk about water now you see I just think of children because we've been working on a, on a project with children about water as you know and um, you mentioned that you had a, a love of maths right from the offset which is very like the Victorian mathematician and astronomer Mary Somerville mm -hmm. um, you were fascinated like she was with the stars as a child and I, I just wondered whether that was something that you still were fascinated by Oh, Francis, I still enjoy it. I have a still the, that scientific book, which I would say that was the foundation of my passion for science and later for engineering and for maths. Um, I still keep that as, as the first thing in my library and um, still the sky and still galaxies fascinates me. And I think um, at some point they inspired me to think big, to imagine things. And, and that was a triggering point, I would say, um, and helped me to shape my imagination and later my strength, um, which I think I still thank my mom for that, that invaluable gift that I got and paved my pathway towards my current career. I really, I, I, I really appreciate her. <laughs> and um, mathematics was quite an important thing for you. And, and, you know, we find that with a lot of scientists and musicians that maths is quite an important thing. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, uh, uh, Platt of Rissell, I was going to call her Baroness Platt of Rissell, but we've been told that that's not how you address <laughs> properly, <laughs> how you say it properly. But Beryl Platt um, uh, um, has passed on her passion for maths to our daughter Vicky. So uh, Vicky, if you're there, would you like to join us and just tell us a little bit about how that passion for maths has shaped your own life? Well, I couldn't say whether my love of maths was nature or nurture. I think it was quite a lot of both in it. Um, but I was never discouraged in maths. And like quite a few of the people here, I just loved explaining it and teaching it and thought everyone should be able to understand it. Um, when I taught in Ghana, I was teaching a class of 55 and there were only about 10 girls in it and the rest were boys. And to start with, the girls really weren't doing well. And so I stopped the class and said, look, everyone can do maths, but you've got to be able to believe you can do maths and think about it and go ahead. Um, so everyone here can do maths. And the girls' maths got so much better just instantly. It was wonderful. Um, and I've done quite a lot of odd bits of teaching maths here and there. I've just seen people gaining understanding. It's just one of those enjoyable things in life. Really good. It's great um, when people have inspiring maths teachers. I mean, uh, you know, and I know that you are one of those, Vicky. I just wondered, Mariam, did you have an inspiring maths teacher? In fact, I did. I did have an inspiring. My, first of all, I have uh, the teacher um, in, in geometry um, in, in high school. He had a his his. I have never seen and um, I've never had after that a teacher with that passion for for math and geometry. He, at a time we had blackboard and chalks, and he had a lot of a colorful um, chalk um, colorful chalkboards actually, and bringing all these chalks to the to the blackboard and trying to draw things, and from the eyes of, of a, I don't know, 13, 14 year old, a 16 year old teenager, that was mesmerizing. He definitely played a very key role. The, I keep paying him visit, now he's retired and visiting and talking to him, but yes, yes, I still have, and I think uh, I had that, that 
I would say role model in maths. Yeah, and you, I know that um, uh, you both you both have a wide experience of teaching, and Mariam, you're doing that now. And I was thinking, Vicky, um, uh, earlier, uh, uh, Patricia was talking about your mother having uh, been cack-handed and totally unsuitable, in fact, as you think, for an engineer. And I'm just wondering if either of you have ever come across anyone that you've taught who doesn't seem to be the right sort of person for the job, but in fact turns out to be. Well, the range is so wide, you know, from the theory to the practice. It, you know, there's a wide range of people who can actually have a role in engineering. And I think my mother was very keen on people who are practical, even though she couldn't, she wasn't that practical herself. And I do remember, actually, there was a child at school, a contemporary of one of my children, and the teacher and the mother were despairing of the child. So I said, look, he's really bright. He was highly dyspraxic. So his handwriting was atrocious. And I said, he's really bright, he'll go far, don't worry. And he ended up with a master's in mechanical engineering. So um, there was a bit of talent spotting there. <laughs> but I think if I'd been at school then, I, I would prob um, now, if I'd been at school now, I would probably have been diagnosed as dyspraxic because I'm hopelessly impractical and I, I've got a degree in physics. And I loved the theory and I loved the maths. I was absolutely hopeless at lining up the bits of apparatus and my graphs were all over the place while everybody else's <laughs> worked. But I mean, that, that sort of category of dyspraxic, dyspraxia, didn't exist when I was at school. Mm -hmm. But I think that's probably what I am. Uh, Vicky, and then my mother found the mechanical drawing, which you had no computer to draw with. She found it really hard. Absolutely. Yeah, I can you, remember. You told, us a, you told us a little story about, um, about what she had to do on her first day at work, Vicky, which I think everybody would love to hear. Uh, so she arrived at work and I think she was wearing her best white, or, you know, a, a really nice dress. And they thought, oh, we'll see what she can do. And they put her in an aircraft and said, right, take the instrument panel apart and put it back together again. So out came the screwdriver. And I, I think her best dress was probably wrecked. Um, but she managed it despite all her lack of, of manual dexterity. <laughs> it's very unlike you, Marion, because you, you, you learned that you were good at that kind of thing with your Lego. Well, yeah, actually, in fact, yes. My, my dad uh, had a passion for civil engineering, I would say. He was always talking, imagining me in a construction site, um, and he, he encouraged me all the time. But he had a passion for maths too. He used to do complicated calculation in his brain, never used calculator. And I was always fascinated how he does that. And, and playing with him, getting to understand how, how he does that was absolutely, it was one of my hobbies to just sit with him whenever I could find him to figure out how he does that. And in fact, I squeezed myself first year I, and I joined ARU to teach mathematics and I did that for two trimesters actually. Um, one of the key things I think in liking or disliking math at some point could be because um, w w they, students need to understand the application of all these equations, calculations in, in a real life application. And one of the um, things that I, I did when I taught mathematics is just to explain, this is not just about the equation with um, or certain constraints. These are the applications. As, as engineers, we need to understand the applications behind those, those equations, actually. And that's one of the, I think that, that plays a very key role in better understanding of that and liking that. Mm. And you, I, um, you, you mentioned as well, Vicky, that um, your mother was quite shy, in fact, to begin with. And, I, you know, I was thinking about her turning up with all these men and, you know, not being very confident, being a little bit shy. <laughs> it just seems like an extraordinary thing to have done. Yeah, I mean, it even started earlier, actually, because when she was at Slough in the sixth form, she had to go to the boys' school to have the physics lessons. And so she was the only girl there. And I think the boys thought it was quite funny. And one of them got the piano and played If You Were the Only Girl in the World. And she was excruciatingly embarrassed by it. Um, and I don't really quite know how she overcame her shyness, but suddenly the confidence built up and, and she was sort of unstoppable. But she just worked at it and wouldn't take no for an answer. Um, 
and, and I think that's really important in whatever you do. Um, just keep chipping away and um, don't be discouraged. I think it's also very helpful to learn that other people also underneath might lack confidence. I mean, your, your mother just looks so powerful and, and competent and efficient as though nothing in the world would worry her. And I think for younger people to know that someone older does feel worried inside is actually quite helpful because otherwise it's too easy to assume that you're the only person in the world who's a bit anxious whereas in fact most of us are melting away inside most of the time or perhaps i'm just speaking for myself in, in fact i experienced that as well vicky i was the only female student in at my time when i did my under, uh, undergrad in the class for four years i needed to live with these boys and we used to have a, a number of, of uh, for example, modules that they needed some lab work, team working, actually. So for the first few times, I was pushed by my, um, my classmates, uh, male classmates, to, oh, you just keep a record of data we collect. So I was the note taker. I was the recorder. That happened that I realized when it came to assessment that they had a lot to talk about from the hands-on experience while I was pushed aside. So in addition to my technical knowledge, I needed to tackle all these or promote my softer skills, how to overcome these boys. These boys could be a sample of, of a real life condition. If I don't manage to tackle that and, and overcome this issue, I would have probably, I would never be successful in my future career. I cried for my dad that that is the situation, but he didn't accept, Joel, find, find your way. Or if there's not any way, make way to break through and, and that was exactly something I experienced as well. Mm. So it sounds as if uh, um, you, you were rather the same as, as uh, Beryl Platt, frankly. Mm -hmm. Exactly, <laughs> and exactly. And then when, when I have lab sessions, for example, that uh, I only have one female student in class, it happens. Um, and I see that sometimes girls might be shy, they stay aside, they start recording things. So I put them on a rotor and I make sure the girl can get equal opportunity, hands-on session experiences and the boys. This is something I reject. I don't accept girls standing aside, staying in a shy mode or something. No, definitely I work on that. That's definitely something that your mother would have approved of, Vicky, given her uh, her work on 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 you know on uh, promoting women in sciences. Uh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> um, she was, you know, gender equality definitely was an issue in our family when we were younger. Um, but my father was very secure. He was not an academic, but he was very practical. And when he built a boat, when I was about twelve or thirteen. And so I used to go down as the free labour um, and he taught me to use circular saws, um, you know, cut up, do woodwork and help make the boat. Um, and that was great. So, I, you know, the practical aspect was sort of also available in our family. And um, what happened at home? Who was in charge of the cooking? Um, well, actually, when my mother was, by the time I was 11 or 12, my mother was out such long hours, I usually did all the cooking for supper when she came home. But I would say on the whole, my mother was in charge of the kitchen. My father, he would cook on the boat and he would cook when my mother was working in Manchester, um, but he left her to it. And um, did, were you treated the same as your brother? Oh gosh, um, well, the, the can-do attitude and, and achieve everything you can, that was certainly, we were treated the same, but we were so different, we were not treated the same at all. <laughs> we but we weren't, same, you know, we weren't sort of discouraged, but we were very different. What about in terms of educational opportunities? Were you given similar educations? Um, I, I, yes, uh, yes and no. I think the secondary school I went to, the girls' school, was very poor, in fact. Um, but I, I recovered in the sixth form and went to a much better school. Um, so, um, you know, it was rescued. But, um, you know, the opportunity was there. But a lot of girls' schools when I was younger were pretty poor. Um, they're still quite often not a bit weak on science and maths. I mean, I think that's a problem for young women who want to study science. 
Yes, actually, that was a particular problem. We had, if we were promoted into the top set to do advanced maths um, for O level, um, I didn't. There wasn't a maths teacher available, so I remember at the school I had an 1874 book to read to get my, you know, maths advanced maths. <laughs> I did get it, but you know, not with a shining grade. I needed a good teacher. <laughs> So I'm, I'm just wondering, we, we could probably chat for hours, but I'm just wondering, um, Victoria, if there are any questions from the audience for our experts today? Hello. Yes, we have got a few. So thanks very much, um, everyone, for putting them into the chat. I'll try and get through them all before eight o'clock. Um, but if there is anything you want to ask, then please feel free. And if I've got time, then I'll, I'll read it out at the end. Uh, so the first one is for Dr. Farah, and that is, are there any schools slash buildings named after Baroness Platt? Um, not that I'm aware of, but I think Vicky might be better placed to answer that. Do you know of any? Um, yes. Ah, good. Uh, there are quite a lot of school blocks. So St. Albans High School, which isn't so far from me, has a Platt block. I think my mother discouraged people from naming buildings after her, but you know, some of them got through, especially if they were science buildings. I suspect there's one at Great Bado Comprehensive, but I don't know. I know she had um, uh, so I think a debate with people at WISE. They wanted to name some special award after her and she refused and she said, nope, wise is the word you name you name it after wise not after me which suggests that she was sort of quite modest in that way i don't think she particularly sought it i know that in Rittal there's an ad adult education community center which is about to be reopened and they are going to name that after her because she's not around to say no <laughs> but i've said yes <laughs> <laughs> very sensible Lovely, thank you for that. Uh, next one is for Vicky and is did Girl talk about her experience as chair as she was the chair for five years during the decade um, when Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister, um, who famously had few women in her cabinet. So did she ever a... discuss that with you? This was for Vicky, sorry. Um, <laughs> so did yeah, did Beryl Platt ever discuss her experiences as the chair of the Equal Opportunities Commission with you? Um, she did a little, um, not a lot. She, I mean, there, there were many aspects of it. No, no one could rein her in. Her enthusiasm was huge. So when she went shopping in Hamleys, the toy shop for some grandchildren's presents, she found all the physics and chemistry sets in the boys department. So she talked to the assistant and said, I need to see the managing director now. Um, and off she'd go and get the whole shop reorganised in a day. Um, and, and Margaret Thatcher was actually a chemist, so she'd have been very sympathetic to getting more women into science and technology. Um, she did a lot at that time. People still didn't have rights after maternity leave. And she really forced forwards the business. If you train women, keep them, but you've got to have options for them because when they're bringing up a family, it's not that easy to work full time. And she pushed through a lot of legislation to protect women's jobs and really changed the face of that side of sort of opportunity. Um, so, so, yes, she did discuss things, but um, not in a lot of detail. Lovely. Thank you for that. Um, another one for Vicky. Was Baroness first or been many before? Sorry, you're breaking up. I yeah, didn't hear we're the struggling question. to hear you, Victoria. Oh, I'm really sorry. I'm not entirely sure what I can do. Am I sounding slightly better now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, was Beryl one of the first to be in the House of Lords, or has there been many before her? Uh, I think there have been quite a lot of women in the House of Lords. She would have been in a minority, but the previous head of the Equal Opportunities Commission was there and introduced her together with 
um, Lord Chelmsford. Um, and there were, there were a sprinkling of women. There wouldn't have been any women bishops at the time. They came later. Um, she was but, the only woman engineer. There were no other yeah. women engineers. She was the first. Yeah. She wasn't the first woman, but she was the first female engineer. Um, and what would you say was Beryl Platt's most, was she most proud of during her career? Do you think it was her science work or the work during the war? Or was it sort of later on where she was counsellor and covering education? Well, that, that's a really hard question to answer. She had in such enthusiasm for everything. Um, and she wasn't a proud woman. She was sort of proud of her brother for his achievements. And she was just a total enthusiast. I think probably her biggest enthusiasm and pride was actually Essex. Because, um, you know, she was born, educated, um, and lived her whole life in Essex and loved it. Oh, that's really good to know. Thank you for that. Um, and now I have a question for Dr. Imani. Um, how many universities have you worked at? Well, um, it started uh, in the UK, started um, in Exeter University in 2008. I was there till 2015. I, I love Devon. I love it. I can't uh, hide that, that I have a passion for Devon and Exeter. Um, and then I, I lived in Essex since then. I, and I love, I absolutely love Essex, actually. So I can say I have settled here. So um, these two universities are the universities I worked, um, but I have collaborated with several other um, universities in, um, across the UK and also outside UK, actually. So I know so many people around the country. Lovely, thank you. I have another one for you as well. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that study in your field is still a male dominated subject or are we seeing more women uh, coming through? Unfortunately, it's much better, but yes, it's, it, 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 it is still male dominated. Um, and the reason I say that because um, I was reading some stats um, a few days ago that proportionally uh, in the UK, amongst the European countries, still we have less uh, female engineers in the field than male engineers. Um, and uh, and the, 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 the mission of exactly the STEM is just, just to, to promote that in, in the field, actually. Um, and, uh, but there are the still, I can say you see more engineer, female engineers, either in practice side or in academic side, uh, but I, we still need to work on that. I still say it's still male dominated. Uh, I still have from 35 students, let's say I get in a class, you may get just one or two female students. Lovely. Thank so are, you. are we done? We are, we are really out of time. Victor. We are. We can pass on to Ian. That's fine. Thank yeah, you for your I question. I think we should pass on to Ian because <laughs> we could be here on it. We could. Oh, okay. That's very kind of you. Uh, I feel very humble uh, listening to all our amazing experts tonight, actually. Um, all, I, all I ever do is get up on a stage and ponce around in fancy outfits. Um, kind of what our experts we've talked about and um, you, you know the modern women that have joined us in all these sessions it's incredible what's going on there and I've learned an awful lot about what actually happens in Essex so I quite understand why Pratt of Rittle was very proud of Essex. Um, I do want to say um, a massive thanks to Herbie for telephoning me some 18 months ago and having a chat about what projects we could do for Essex 2020. And of course, a massive thanks to Francis, artistic director from Electric Voice Theatre for bringing us these stories of these amazing women from all over Essex during the last six weeks. Very quickly, also, I wanna thank Chelsea City Council, Mark DF and Katie Deverell, Essex 2020 Arts Council England, Essex County Council, PRS, and of course, everybody here at Chelmsford City Theatres. For further details about the next session, you can join in with Echoes from Essex. Go to chelmsford.gov, UK Theatres, and of course, Electric Voice Theatre. But this is, of course, not the end, because please do join us next week to hear our young future scientists, engineers, and composers 
tell you more about water systems in Essex and why water's worth saving in the world premiere of the Water Cycle Mega Song with a film by Jack Cornell showing off the children's water system models. It's also not too late to add your voice to our Essex virtual choir and learn the chorus of our Echoes from Essex song. And if you've enjoyed what you've seen tonight, please do uh, come back on Wednesday at seven o'clock and join in with the Essex virtual choir. And so just to remind you again, as I said, um, this is not the end of the sessions. Next Monday, 7th of September at seven o'clock, Soundings, episode seven, Water and Land, Splash, burble, gurgle, whoosh, which I do so love saying as much as I really enjoy watching uh, Lauren sign it. So splash, burble, gurgle, whoosh next Monday at seven o'clock. And also Dr. Patricia Farah will also talk about the year 1858, which was, of course, the year of the great stink. <laughs> Believe me, just be grateful. No one has invented smelly Zoom yet. So again, thank you to all our amazing experts and all our amazing artists and everyone who joined us tonight. And from all of us here, please now sit back and enjoy a very special preview of the children's mega song. And just before you do, can I have a big hand please for Lauren Lister, our British Sign Language interpreter. Thank you, Hi. Lauren. And thank you to Maria Mani. Thank you. And Vicky Platt. Hello. And Patricia Farah, Hi. and one of our wonderful singers, Jenny Miller. Thank you, Jenny. Ooh. And here we have our our little little tiny preview of the children's um, mega song. And I listen to the bath water coming out of the tap. It always sounds as if there's music. Water cycles. Save me, watchers will save me, watchers will save me. 